So when we started the book of Genesis, we learned that Genesis gives us a record of four outstanding events, which was the creation of the heavens and the earth and the creation of Adam and Eve, the fall of man of mankind in the Garden of Eden, the flood when God poured out his judgment on man for their wickedness through Noah, and God continued his promise through him of the Messiah. Many generations had passed you know, and, and they, they grew and, and they multiplied, but they were supposed to multiply and fill out the earth. So we had it where uh, uh, God, he just kind of disrupted their languages at the Tower of Babel, and then they ended up scattering because they were all speaking one language. Uh, so they scattered throughout the world, which explains, you know, the different races and languages and nations. So we have these four events in Genesis along with the record of four great men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we'll be going into Joseph soon, which these are the patriarchs of Israel. And we left off last week where Abraham took a wife at the age of 138 years old of age, and he had six sons from uh, Keturah. But then Abraham sent them out east to protect the promise, you know, that he had in Isaac because he was going to carry the bloodline that leads, leads us to the Messiah. And he gives everything to Isaac, so out of protection, he sent them on their way. And then we saw Abraham pass away at the age of 175 years old. If anything, Abraham showed us that he was uh, full of faith. He was a faithful man. But we also saw that he wasn't perfect, right? He showed us that he's very much a lot like us today. But he was a friend of God because of his faithfulness to God. And so Abraham, he dies, and now we shift focus on his son Isaac, so Isaac and Ishmael, at, after he passed, they buried uh, Abraham, and then, you know, life went on. Where we saw Isaac pleading to God, right, on behalf of Rebekah to have a child because she was barren just like Sarah. And God granted his request, and she became pregnant with twins, and we read that they were twins, right? That these twins, Esau and Isaac, were in the womb of Rebekah, and they were sort of like fighting in the womb, making her pregnancy extremely miserable. But God explains and says to Rebecca, hey, like two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So we saw Esau was born first. They called him Esau because he was red and very hairy. And then Jacob was born, and he was grabbing hold of the heel of Esau when he came out. So they called him Jacob, which meant heel catcher, or one who trips one up. So the boys grew up, and we learned that Esau was an outdoorsman, a hunter of game, and that Isaac favored Esau. And then Jacob was one who took care of the tents. He stayed close to home, you know, maintaining the herds and the flock, but he was really close to home. And Rebekah favored Jacob. And this environment, we all know as parents, is, is not a good recipe at all. It, it was not good. One day, Jacob, we saw that he made a, a bowl of red stew. Esau came in from the field. He was empty-handed, but he was very weary. And I said to Jacob, please feed me the same red stew, like the one that you're cooking right there, for I am weary. Jacob took this opportunity because he saw that Esau was vulnerable to bargain with him to sell him his birthright as of that day. And what did we see? We saw that Esau, he didn't really care about his birthright, and he sold it to Jacob, and he ate this bowl of stew, and he went on his way, so he gave his birthright to Jacob without a care. Thus, the Bible said that he despised his birthright, but he would later complain about it, and we'll see that a little bit later. We know that God promised that the younger would be served by the older, but here we see that Jacob tripped up his brother, Esau, to take the birthright from him. So we're already seeing that he's taken on the very nature of his name. And we pick things up now in Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. There was a famine in the land, and the land that we're talking about is Canaan, and that's where Isaac is. Besides the first land, a famine that was in the days of Abraham, which if you remember, the famine caused Abraham to go where? He went to Egypt, right? And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. 
So famines at that time were very uh, extremely serious back then. As they are today, we can't downplay famines, but the difference is that we have greater resources to, uh, to transport relief out to these places that there are famines into all parts of the world today. But then you had to move. In that culture at that time, you had to go somewhere because it was, it was a matter of survival. You know, it was serious business, meaning life or death, and it could completely wipe out an entire family. And during this famine, Isaac is about 80 years old. And the previous famine that they mentioned that happened through Abraham's life was about 100 years uh, prior. So we're seeing this huge time uh, lapse that has happened, right? So with that time given, this is not the same Abimelech that Abraham comes across, all right? Abraham dealt with, you know, when he was going through the famine where he, you know, brought his wife out there, played that whole game, hey, you're my sister, and Abimelech took Sarah into his harem. And then remember he had the dream where God says you're a dead man, basically? Remember that? Uh, this is not the same Abimelech. But remember, the, the name Abimelech is a title. It's like Pharaoh. It's like, uh, as you would, like Caesar. It's just, it's a title of a, of a ruler or a king. And, and he was considered the king of Ger- Gerar. So this famine hits. And Isaac travels to Abimelech in Gerar, which is about 20 miles southeast from Gaza, a city that was by the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. So he's traveling south, and God warned him, Hey, do not go to Egypt. The thing about Egypt was in that time, and we saw it through Abraham's time, is that everyone would sort of flee that direction, especially during a famine, right? And it was, it was tempting for Isaac at this same point to want to go in that direction, and I'll explain why. Egypt was filled with rivers, he was, and it was just fertile soil. So if, if anybody was escaping a famine, they would want to go to Egypt and they can continue their, their crops and growing uh, and, and survive. So Egypt had everything. And apparently this was a temptation that began to fill Isaac's heart. But God comes to him and clearly tells him, hey, don't go down there. Don't go to Egypt. For he was to live in the land of promise. It's like, hey, don't leave the land that I'm giving you. You have to stay here. You got to stay with me. Remain with me. Don't go down to Egypt. Now, later in Scripture, Egypt would end up representing the world. From the time of Isaac to our present day, and we can already see that through Isaac's circumstances, that when life begins to have a famine or becomes dry or difficult in our own lives as believers, There's a great temptation in our own lives to take control, take control of everything and away from God, out of his hands, put it in our own hands, and enter back into the world under its ways and its cultures and sort of kind of blend in to make life a little bit easier. So they go to Egypt, right? And the Lord gives us this picture in his word for us to learn from, that when we as Christians live in peace, and are walking with God, and things are going great, we tend to think in our minds, hey, following God is pretty easy. It's joyous. It's every Sunday. It's great. But as soon as things get difficult and get very hard to deal with, there's a great temptation to take back control from God, where we're not walking in faith anymore because why? We're making things happen. And then we begin to deceive ourselves into thinking that we're dealing, hey, I'm dealing with the real world here. You know, this is our reality. God, you know, I, I, I'll attach myself spiritually with you, but right now I'm dealing with some reality stuff here that's in my face, you know. And so we take things into our own hands and enter where things should be easy for us, and we kind of step away from faith. And here, this is what Isaac is dealing with. There's this temptation to take things into his own hands and go to Egypt where he doesn't need faith, where it's a sure thing. You know, and I get it. I get, I get what Isaac's feeling right here. It's easier when we are in control, right? At least we think. And the Lord warns him not to go to Egypt. 
And I believe the Lord is sharing the same thing with us tonight. Maybe there's something you're dealing with, things are rough and becoming very difficult, but he's warning you, do not be tempted to take things into your own hands and rush to Egypt. We cannot see beyond our current situation. You know that, right? Every time we're in, in the thick of it, we can't see beyond it. We only see what's in us, right, right in our face, right at this time. So he's telling us, you know, remain with me. Because, you know, the problem is, is that when we tend to take things into our own hands and start uh, you know, making decisions, rushing to Egypt and all that, uh, we go from one problem to another problem. Sometimes we're, we're in the midst of this problem. We think that we can leave from this problem. We enter into another one that we're not expecting, but it usually it stems from what we decide already here from this problem. So he's warning us, do not be tempted. And he's telling us that in these times, do not give up on me. Trust in me. Remain in me. And I will guide you through this difficult time, through this famine. And it's true. How many of you have seen him uh, walk with you through a difficult season, right? And guide you out of it. He, he doesn't leave you there. He guides you out of it. And we learn that he doesn't lead you right into another famine. No, he, he, you learn with what you're, you're dealing with in that famine, that dryness, that season. And he, you are able to have it, find his peace after it. And you seek him. You're like, oh. And then you can look back and you're like, Lord, you were with me. You were with me. How many of us have taken control of things and find ourselves out of a problem but entering a new one right away? Hmm. This is exactly our nature. This is what we do, right? Look at Abraham. He went to Egypt to escape the famine. He deceives people to make them think Sarah is his sister, which ended up blowing up in his face, right? Remember? He made one bad decision after another. But here is what we did not see through his circumstance. We did not see the Lord telling him, go to Egypt, right? That didn't happen. Abraham saw the famine, and he took control. He started to make the decisions, and he left the land in which the Lord brought him to. Right in the middle of God's will, Abraham leaves. And it's interesting that Isaac is in the middle of God's will as well, and here a big famine hits. It's serious and it's life-threatening, and Isaac is tempted to take control. And sometimes, also, we tend to think that because we are in God's will, that things won't get difficult. For some reason, it's all just blessings and, 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 and greatness, and, oh, God is good, and hands are lifted up, and that's great, that's true, but sometimes we don't think that anything bad could happen. Why? Because we're doing God's will. But have you ever experienced what God calls you to do something and things are coming together and you're doing his will and all of a sudden things get extremely difficult? Then what happens? What happens in the midst of that? Yeah, we freak out. But we begin to start doubting ourselves. Like, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing here? What, what is all the meaning of this? And I have to ask the question, why do we do this? Because in our mind, we typically believe that God's calling is always easy. But that's not always true. Because we have to understand what we are not the ones who defines what his will is for us or what his calling is for us. Right? We have to remember that. You know, we could be facing extremely, uh, you know, an extremely difficult time and be right in God's will. That's the bottom line. Right where he has you, He's working in you. You have to remember that. He is working in you, and he's working in it if we're in a famine. We just need to trust in him and obey him, and that is the theme that we're going to see through this chapter. And we, we do this also by through prayer and his word and following him. So with the famine, God tells Isaac, do not go to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. And God said, dwell in this land, verse 3, and I will be with you and bless you. Here the Lord gives you a promise. All right, first we see what the circumstance may be, but here we see the promise to stand on through a famine in your life. The Lord tells Isaac, dwell here. In other words, obey me. Dwell here. I'm putting you right here. And look. 
what comes after. I will be with you. This is a verse, if you have a highlighter, you need to highlight this one. Here's the Lord's promise, straight up. Obey me, and my presence will be with you, and I will bless you. Sounds pretty solid to me. Obey the Lord and trust him, and he will be with you and bless you. So when you are facing a famine in your life, hold on to this verse. The key is obedience. Obey him, and God will do the rest. And he tells Isaac, for to you and your descendants, I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. So here we need to take note that the Lord appears to Isaac, as he did to Abraham, and gives Isaac the promise that he gave to his father, Abraham. So now this promise will be carried out through Isaac, that he would bless the world, and it will be done now through Isaac. Now, we see that the promise of the land was to Abraham, but now God is telling us, obviously, that it's through Isaac here, and that I will carry my oath through you. And the significance here is, when we look at the great controversy in the world today over who does the land of Israel belong to, well, we see that it belonged to Abraham, and now it is through Isaac, which tightens the bloodline, right, too. The descendants of Abraham and Isaac, the land belongs to them. If you look in the Middle East, everybody wants claims. They believe it's their land, and they're all trying to get pieces back to it. But Scripture tells us that it belongs to the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. And then even later, it's going to tighten up more. Once Jacob, it goes from Isaac to Jacob. So the bloodline is going to be even more clear that it belongs to Israel. And the Lord says in verse 4, And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, through your seed, the Messiah will come through Isaac's bloodline. And through this, not only would the Jews be blessed, but all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through the birth of Jesus, Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago in human history, and we today are definitely blessed, amen? <laughs> yes. Verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So here, God emphasizes to Isaac the importance of obedience. It's important. We have seen how Abraham made some bad decisions, right? We've seen it through his marriage especially. Sarah was a special woman. With how many times, you know, she was, you know, put in a harem, the, the two times, you know, or being barren through that whole time and had to, to watch, uh, you know, Ishmael grow up. But the truth is, he didn't practice sin. He had his flaws, but he didn't practice sin. God characterized Abraham as obedient, right? He never ignored God. And out of 175 years of age, he was characterized as being obedient to him, a friend of God. It wasn't characterized by his failures. It wasn't characterized by his mistakes, which few were recorded. But as we see, that's not how he's characterized. So I just kind of want to let you guys know that, you know, God sees us for our obedience to him, our love for him. He did, he, when he forgives us of our sin, when we repent, he doesn't see that anymore. Remember, that is wiped away. Okay, that is wiped away. So he doesn't characterize us by our failures or mistakes. A lot of times we tend to get wrapped up into that axle, right? And that's a lot of times the devil likes to bring that up more, more often. Either it's the axle that you just fell in or maybe it's something from your past. But we're released from that. God doesn't characterize us by our mistakes, our failures, or even our past. We, he sees the blood of Christ on us, amen? So verse 6, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And so we see... He obeys God here. Verse 7, And then men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She's my sister. Boy. <laughs> like father, like son, right? It's almost like we're re, you know, reading about Abraham again, but this is Isaac. Well, it's in the genes, right? And I mean going as back far as to Adam and Eve, Right? We are born as sinners, and we have a tendency to respond this way, you know, just kind of out of fear or out of uh, just to cover our backs, just to make sure we're okay. 
But we, he also has the genes that were passed down from him, from dad and mom. And now the traits, you know, we're, we're seeing that are coming through bloom through Isaac uh, from his household, from his upraising. And here Isaac, you know, he's a chip off the old block. Um, and he picks this trait to go after his father. And because this is the same situation that Abraham was in, Isaac is reacting the same way by trying to lie his way out of it, claiming Rebekah, his wife, to be his sister. And what was his reasoning? Look at this. He, for he was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she's beautiful to behold. That is textbook Abraham again. That's the whole reason why he says, hey, claim that, you know, you're my sister. So Isaac, like his father, was driven by fear, not trusting in the Lord. God promised that he would be with him and bless him, but Isaac is standing, is he, is he standing in this moment on that promise? No, because he's not trusting in the Lord at this part. He's, he's having to take hold of the rings. Well, she's my sister, you know, so he's not really trusting him. He was obeying God and trusting him where to stay. That's the big picture, but not trusting him in the details. That's the small picture. It's why we see so much in the New Testament and the teaching of how to be a servant. Jesus demonstrated to the world the life of a servant. And we serve our Lord, right, as a servant, and our master, and we serve God alone. The servant doesn't define how to be a servant. No. He just does what the Lord tells him to do. No asking questions. Just get it done, right? So big picture things and small picture things. So we are trying to bring all things to him. That's the, that's the difference. He, he, if you notice in Abraham and Isaac, a lot of times it's responding. You know, we, we see these stories of them responding to God. God meets him here. And, but, you know, they also do the prayer thing, and there's 107. I mean, he's a friend of God, Abraham, so we, Isaac had to learn some good things through him as well. But the thing that, as, as being a servant, uh, we are to bring all things to him, big or small. All decisions, all questions need to be brought to him, and then we need to obey him in all those things as well. Jesus demonstrated that to us by his obedience to the Father. All things he did was by the direction of the Father. He trusted in the Father and served him in the small things, teaching of the kingdom of heaven, and in the big things, the cross. Isaac is obeying God, being where God wanted him to be, but he disobeys God while he steps away from the promise and makes a decision out of fear. And that's a bad place to ever make a decision from, period, fear. He makes the same decision, you know, by also assuming you know, about the people that they would kill him. He misjudges the people, you know, that they would kill him over Sarah and, you know, and take her. And remember, the people of Egypt and the people of uh, Gerar as well, they were appalled. They, they kicked him out of Egypt with an escort to make sure he was gone. And in, in, in front of Bimelech, he publicly rebukes him for the same thing. He totally reacted out of ignorance. And we will see that Isaac does the same exact thing as his dad. And the people would respond the same way when they discovered the truth. So he's dwelling in Gerar. Men asked if Rebekah was his wife, and out of fear tells them that she is his sister. I'm like, good grief. Verse 8, now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Now, the King James Version says that Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, so maybe they were playing one on one hoops, you know, in the courtyard. But no, actually, the sporting meanings to go, they're like playing with each other. There's like this, this, this kindness that's happening, you know, this giddiness, showing endearment by caressing, you know, and kissing, right? Something you don't want, you don't do with your sister. It just doesn't happen. So with Uncle Fester eyes, Abimelech <laughs> witnesses the truth, and then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on her account of her. In other words, he's saying, because I thought you would kill me for her. And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? 
He was like, how could you think of us like that and do this? We see Abimelech was insulted, right, by how Isaac thought of his people. And he tells Isaac, one of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. And this tells us that not a finger was put on Rebekah. Right? No, no one touched her. But Abimelech was upset that because of his lie, right, one of his men could have brought guilt on them all for violating a marriage here, right? Wow. A pagan king showing more respect for marriage than even Mr. Godly Isaac here. So Abimelech charged all his people, verse 11, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So he throws out a declaration, an order. Do not touch these people to ensure their safety of these two and also to remove this kind of fear that uh, Isaac had for the people of Gerar. Then Isaac, verse 12, sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Wow. I'm like, what? When I was reading, I'm like, what? Why would God bless him right after this mess? It kind of seems like God blesses him right after he did something bad. Is God an enabler? No, not at all. Isaac loved the Lord, right? He may have slipped up here, but to put things in perspective, let me ask a few questions. Do you believe that the public rebuke from the pagan king humbled him? Oh, yeah. Do you believe Isaac felt shame? Oh, I, I do. Do you believe Isaac repented to the Lord? I do. Because as we'll read about Isaac, he never does this again, unlike his father. His father did it twice, remember? Now, when you go through a humbling experience like this, does God abandon you? No. I believe... Isaac repented to God and continued to serve and obey him because this experience in itself drew him closer to God. Therefore, can we agree that God poured out his grace on him? Because that's what grace is. It's grace. <laughs> he is faithful to us even when we fall short. And he knows we can be very hard on ourselves. How many people is hard on themselves when, when they slip up or or anything. Yeah. So God knows when to discipline us, right? And he knows when to encourage us as well, all under the banner of his grace. And God blessed Isaac 100-fold. I mean, for a farmer, that is, you know, 100 for 100, that's awesome, right? You don't get better than that. Now, keep in mind, as we look at this, it seems like it just happens pretty rapidly right after but there was, there was a lot of hard work put into that. He labored and sowed into that land. And that takes time. But we also see God continuing his promise to Isaac. He didn't say, oh, you blew it. I'm done with you. Depart from me. You know, God is faithful even when we fall. And he looks at your heart, the heart that you have for him. He knows your sincerity. You, there's nothing hidden before God, right? He knows everything about you. And guess what? He knows we're going to fall again. He knows when and all that. He, that. And that is why the blood of Christ covers us. It's already cleansed us from our, pla our past, right? But as you see, he, he constantly washes our feet. He cleanses us as we walk with him. It says that in 1 John, right? So when, remember this. When you walk in obedience, all right, the Lord says, I will be with you. And I will bless you. So we have to be obedient. And when we're in his will and are, are, and are be, obeying him, everything that he's telling us to do, he blesses us, right? And we know he's with us because he speaks to us. He guides us. He leads us. He gives us wisdom. He is with us. And praise God, dwells in us, right? And this will be a witness to those around Isaac, as well, this blessing, this hundredfold blessing is going to be a witness to everybody, all the Philistines, same as it was with Abraham, right? They saw that his God blessed him everywhere he went. And the Philistines will see that through Isaac's life as well, that even if a person falls short and messes up, his God still is with him and still blesses him. Yes, he does, right? Verse 13, 
So the man, the man being Isaac, began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Well, thank you, Moses. That's pretty clear. All this increase was happening in Isaac's life, and he was best, uh, blessed abundantly, and it's amazing. He says, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. But it does create a problem. Look what it says next. So the Philistines envied him. The Philistines around him, see, they were watching all this prosperity happen, and they envied him. But this wasn't the kind of envy, oh, like, oh, I wish I had everything that they had. In Hebrew, envied means that they were bitter jealous, annoyed, heated to the point of torment. That's, that's a bad envy here. This envy was more like, if I can't have it, then he can't have it. Now, the Philistines, verse 15, had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with dirt. So now they're taking action. That, that livelihood, that water, you know, they, they went in there and they filled it up with dirt that, that Abraham had dug out. So they were, they were going to, to stop this prosperity, and they were wanting to drive them out of their land. And Abimelech, verse 16, said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So here what you see is Abimelech now taking action. Right? He sees that they are prosperous within his city and knows from all that he has seen that Isaac is mightier than he was. He was seeing that clearly. Therefore, since he couldn't foresee the future, uh, he can only see the perspective that was given to him right in front of him, so he decided that the best thing for him and himself was to get them out of here before they take over, right? So he tells them to leave, although he will change his mind in a couple of verses. We'll see that. So then Isaac, verse 17, departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So Isaac, as you can see, he's not a man uh, of, of confrontation. He avoids conflict here. Doesn't argue with them. He just takes all that he has and goes his own way. He goes to the valley. And, and Isaac, verse 18, dug the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. So there was this well that they went back to and were redigging it, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. Right? <clears throat> so he, he, he goes out there. They redig it up to have access to water. I mean, that's the first thing you're going to do if you live out in the desert was, hey, we need water source. He called them by names which his father had called them, right? Also, verse 19, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Running water is basically a spring, right? And that's like striking it rich over there because you, there's a difference, right? You, have, you could find a well of sitting water. Right, that has a lot of water, but it's, it's sitting water. But if you have a spring that's constant, that's fresh water. It's like having to choose, okay, I'm going to find this nice flowing water over here or this pond that's just been sitting there. You're going to want the, the one that's moving that's, that's fresher water. You don't want that sitting water. So this was like striking it rich. This was valuable to them. Verse 20, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek because they quarreled with him. So I'm sure this quarrel wasn't just a bunch of verbal, you know, heated arguments. I think this was beyond that. So he called this well Essek, meaning contention. So the herdsmen of Gerar, they overtook that well. So verse 21, then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. So this very same thing had happened. And remember, you know, they envied Isaac. Remember, this was all out of envy. This was much more than the wells. They, in a sense, was telling him, no, you go away further. You go far away from us. This is our land. So he called the well, Sitna, meaning opposition or enmity. Now, verse 22. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So apparently he was far enough. <laughs> okay, we're good with that. Because they did not contend for it. So he called its name Rehoboth, meaning room or roominess. He said, for now the Lord has made 
room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Verse 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. So we see Isaac now out of his comfort zone in Gerar. And it looks like Isaac begins to live in fear again, starts to, starts to build that up. And the Lord appears to him because of his fear to let him know, do not fear, for I am with you. You're not alone. I'm here with you to bless you. You're okay. And this is our God of comfort here to remove our fear and, and grow our confidence you know, through his comfort. And he says to him, I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant's sake, Abraham's sake. So he's telling him, when you think about everything in context, look, I was with you, right, when they told you to go. I was with you when they quarreled with you over the wells. I saw how dirty they were with you. But Isaac, I hold the big picture in my hands. Keep your eyes on the big picture because every promise I have made to you is going to happen. And everyone will see my promise to you through your life. And sometimes in our lives, when we have been done wrong by another or strong-armed in a dirty way or, you know, where we are left in fear of losing friends or a job position and it's affecting our livelihood, God comes in, right? He lets you know, look, I was there. I was there. I saw it all. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about anything. I am with you. And then the Lord reminds you of his promise. Obey me and trust me and I will be with you and I will bless you. Isaac did nothing wrong in this situation at all. And he loses friends because I'm sure he had friends in Gerar. I mean, for a while they had a good relationship with Abimelech. But through all this circum, through his prosperity, you know, he loses his friends. He loses his home, his area, all the work that he had done, you know, in his fields. And he had to start over again. So remember, difficult can happen. Difficult times can happen when we are in the middle of God's will. Okay? But I will say this too. There's always a flip side. You know, they did they did Isaac really bad here. That in the concerning the ones who wronged him, I believe that God, through this situation, can stamp it into the heart of someone, right? In their very conscience, where their heart is exposed, their heart is exposed before the Lord, where they begin to see their wrong in the light of the Lord. And then in their mind, because they know that they are wrong and they did all the wrongs, they will see God raise his righteous servant up blameless before their own conscience. And maybe through this, this one, this one situation, this could bring that one to the Lord. So there is a flip side. We always have to seek the Lord through it. If we're done wrong, we pray for them, that God would reveal that to them, and that ultimately they can come to the Lord as well. So while Isaac is dealing with the aftermath of all that had just happened, the Lord fills Isaac with the comfort of his presence, right, and the words of his promise and reminds him, keep your eyes on me. And that, to me right there, that's his faithfulness. And it shows to us that even in the midst of that whole circumstance, Isaac remained obedient because God was with him, right? He had to obey. Verse 25, so he built an altar. And this is his response to the Lord. He built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pinched his tent there. Must be in the genes. He learned something good from his father, right? He builds an altar there for all that the Lord has done in his life, and then he called on the name of the Lord. And we also see like his father, he pitched his tent there. So he was a pilgrim himself. He didn't lay down roots. He, he, was, he was willing to go whenever the Lord told him. So he was a pilgrim in the land. And there, Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Pichol, the commander of his army. So last time we saw this with Abraham, and we saw Pichol coming with uh, Abimelech, 
there was a covenant. Something was about to happen because you needed that witness there, right? We don't know exactly what it was, but they're showing up on the scene. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? In other words, last time I was in your presence, you said, go away. You drove me out of your city. Now you want to talk. Verse 28, but they said, we have certainly, in other words, without a doubt, have seen the Lord is with you. So they have seen all that the Lord has done through Isaac's life. It was clear to them, clear as day, that God was with them. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So they want to make a covenant with Isaac because they see that the Lord is with him. They see it. And they wanted to make sure that they are good with him. Now, they did do exactly what they said. You know, we sent you away in peace. You know, we didn't harm you or nothing. We told you just to go away. Um, but now they want to make sure that uh, they're on the right side of Isaac's God as well. Because I'm sure word got back to Bim like, what, you drove, you, what, with the wells? You did what? <laughs> so he, that's why they went looking for him. And uh, he says, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So verse 30, he made them a feast and they ate and drank, basically to seal the deal. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, we have found water, a double blessing, a covenant of peace and finding water, God is good. So he called it Sheba. And beer, if you remember, because it's going to be Beersheba, but Sheba means an oath. And so they're calling the well uh, the, the well of the oath, Beersheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Now, we're shifting gears here to Esau. There's just a couple of verses here. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Ellen, the Hittite. And we know just by that alone that the Hittites, those were those Canaanite women, right? Canaanites. Uh, and they, it says, verse 35, and they were a grief of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. So the daughter-in-laws were a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Wow. But Esau, he did not have a spiritual bone in his body. He didn't. He went against the pattern established by Abraham that they were not to marry any of the women of the Canaanites. This gives us insight into Esau's character. According to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. I'm going to stop there. That right there gives us a little bit more insight about Esau. But the thing is, is he just didn't get it. You know, he married these Canaanite women did not care about anything but his own appetite. And we already seen that, right? And it grieved his parents. And we will stop here and continue on to chapter 27, Lord willing. So let us pray.